Well, you know, in the 1990s, um, I headed up an, uh, a project that was providing briefings to uh, the United States president and the, his CIA director at the time, Bill Clinton, CIA director um, R. James Woolsey, uh, on the question of what are UFOs, uh, how, how are they uh, being kept secret, and why. And as it turned out, and I, I didn't believe this initially, uh, the CIA director who I briefed um, had tried to look into it, and he just basically hit a brick wall, that the compartmentalization of the intelligence programs were were such that it, it was a puzzle palace, as they call it, and, and he really wasn't getting any straight answers. In fact, he told us that he was being lied to. So w we began a process of putting together testimony and government documents um, related to the subject, and as it turned out, uh, it started out with maybe a dozen of these sort of military uh, whistleblowers or, or top secret witnesses, and now we have over 550 of them. But at, at that time, we were just trying to provide the background information so that the President and the Congress could end the secrecy on this and bring this information out. As it turned out, um, neither the President nor members of Congress really wanted to step into this very controversial issue. Um, and as they probe deeper, uh, I think what they realize is that the reasons for the secrecy were rather appalling, and it has to do a, a great deal with technology and science and not so much little green men. In other words, the energy and propulsion systems that are behind these things that people see zipping along on a radar scope at uh, 20 or 30,000 miles per hour and making a right-hand turn are simply not normal aerodynamic uh, carbon-based jet fuel aircraft. They are dealing with an entirely new type of physics. And that science has been classified because disclosure of that information would terminate the need for oil and gas and coal and nuclear power. And this turns out to be a good thing if you look at it from the point of view of the environment and the whole of humanity, but a very daunting thing from the point of view of macroeconomic politics and the multi-trillion dollar uh, energy sector. So it, it isn't as simple as people think. And a lot of people think, well, just because you're the president or the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, you can wave a magic wand and, and, and effect change on something like this. And I'm, I'm afraid that simply isn't true. Now, let me go back to a few uh, assumptions that were contained in your, your, your statement. First of all, you say, how and why are information about UFOs being kept secret? Your assumption is that they are deliberately being kept secret. Give me some, some evidence of this, if you would, please. Yeah, well, for example, the, the senior investigator for the uh, FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration in the United States, uh, came to me after he heard of what we were doing. And it turned out that there was an event in Alaska uh, back some years ago where a massive uh, UFO was tracked on radar near a Japan Airlines flight. And we scrambled jet fighters, U.S. fighters, up to that site. And there, this man, who was the head of accidents and investigations for the FAA, John Callahan, who is, uh, if you go to disclosureproject.org, you will see you know, his testimony there, he came to me with the actual original radar tapes because he was at a briefing where there were people from the CIA and Ronald Reagan's science advisor staff and people like that. At the end of the meeting, the people with the intelligence community stood up and said, look, this event never happened. We are going to confiscate all these documents and all these radar tapes, and no one is ever to speak of this. Well, this man was outraged by this, and as it turned out, ironically, they confiscated duplicates of the radar tracings. He then, after he retired, gave the disclosure project, the originals. Now, that's one of 550 men like that and okay. some women that we have. So it's not a question of whether it's been kept secret. It's the, the big question is the why, and that's always the hardest one to answer, and that's what we've been trying to answer. Okay, well, we'll come to that in just a moment and how that would take place. But you mentioned that you you did give a briefing some time back to then uh, Director of the Central Intelligence Agency, James Woolsey, under Bill Clinton, and he told you that he had been lied to when he was trying to find some background information. Can you put that in context for me? Exactly in what way was the head of the CIA lied to? By whom? What, what circumstances? Well, he, the president um, at the time, Clinton, had stated, and of course his good friend um, uh, who was in the Department of Justice um, uh, actually admitted this, that, that Clinton wanted to find out about this subject. He had heard that things like this were going on, highly classified, uh, and he wanted to be briefed on it. 
he asked some of his people to look into it. They couldn't find out anything. The CIA director looked into it, and basically in a, in a letter that his, uh, a man who worked very closely with the CIA director, Wolsey, uh, sent me, and I have this letter, it states that basically they were lied to, and they were basically told uh, no such projects are going on, and they knew they were being deceived. So th- th- it's not as if they, these people are, are stupid. Um, and so what happened Deceived is, is that by, by whom, Stephen Greer? Des- who exactly was deceiving them? People that, you know, employees in the CIA, that would indicate that they could be compelled to talk. They could say, mate, you're not being honest with me, you're fired. Well, it doesn't work that way, and this is the big mistake that people, uh, they project their high school civics lessons of how government works with the reality of the world that conflate the two. Uh, in reality, it when, just because you're the head of the CIA or the president, and these guys come every two to four to six years, doesn't mean that they're read into or briefed on all these highly secretive projects. So what happens in that case is that many times they will be turning to people who themselves honestly don't know. If they do know, they are in a project which in the United States is called an unacknowledged special access project. And an unacknowledged project means that if someone is not actually in that operation, it doesn't matter what their rank is, they are instructed to turn to that general or cabinet level person and basically deny the existence of the project. I didn't believe this was possible until a former uh, staffer on Ronald Reagan's National Security Council staff told me that this went on all the time. And then later, my military advisor, who had been in these sort of unacknowledged projects, said, yes, this is how they work. Uh, and a lot of people need to understand that the United States, uh, as, as Eisenhower said, has a vast military and industrial complex. We have a black budget in the $100 billion to $200 billion a year in the United States, which is larger than any other defense budget in the world. And in that massive undertaking, there are a lot of highly compartmented projects that simply escape oversight by the Congress and the President. So it, it, this is something that is part of the legacy of the buildup in the post-World War II era that Eisenhower, in fact, warned us about. He was a, a five-star general who said, beware of the military-industrial complex. Not that he was against the military, but he knew and had witnessed firsthand this sort of large uh, undertaking that had taken place where he was being deceived of projects. In fact, one of Eisenhower's staffers uh, who was an attorney who died recently, uh, God rest his soul, uh, who is one of our disclosure project witnesses, um, uh, Stephen Lubkin, stated that Eisenhower was uh, sharing with him stories of reports of our interceptors chasing these UFOs, but that many of the projects that were studying the energy and propulsion aspects of it were outside of his reach, that he had escaped, uh, basically they had escaped his control and oversight, which led to his famous speech as he left office in January 1961 when he said, beware the military-industrial complex. So th- th- there's a very long history of this, and people who've done national security studies, uh, and not just the, in this area, but in other areas, have testified to this. I mean, in fact, Senator Inouye, of, uh, when he was looking into the Iran-Contra affair, said uh, that there is a secret government with its own Air Force, its own Navy, its own funding mechanism that's above the law and free from the law itself. I'm quoting almost word for word from the senator. Now that, so so that, that is true. And, that, and unfortunately, this is, is coming – the chickens are coming home to roost in the sense that now, after all these years of secrecy, we're still burning coal and oil like we were in the 1800s. Now, let me just go back a little bit to uh, President Eisenhower's comments that are quite famous or infamous now, uh, that are quoted for everyone by, by – um, Islamists who fear Israel, to anarchists who fear uh, what's happening in England, to goodness knows what. I often have those things sent to me by different people, those words sent to me by different people who claim that, that the world is being governed by shadowy forces. So you, your contention is that that uh, the US military for its own purposes is either covering up or manipulating the evidence or the data about UFOs or is actively involved in creating alternative energy uh, um, uh, craft the, and, and the, the, trying to keep it yes, secret? Well, a, a very small part of the military, and I'll give you an example. I personally briefed the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, what we call J2, and this is an admiral. Uh, and. Uh, he, I had given him a document, which we've now released. Um, it was a secret document that had the project code names and code numbers as of the 1990s dealing with this subject. He was able to identify one of those operations, and he called them up, and he said, look, this is Admiral so-and-so, and I want to be briefed 
on this project. His name was Admiral Tom Wilson. I'll just tell you that. He's out of office now. And Admiral Wilson was told by the person at the other end of the phone, they said, sir, we know who you are, but we will not brief you on this matter. He said, well, look, I'm the head of intelligence for the Joint Staff. If I don't have a need to know who does, and they just said, sir, we cannot have this discussion with you, hung up on him and then blocked his line. Now, this is something that I'll testify under oath in court to, and this is the sort of thing that would, goes would on. He, so would he testify that? Would the, ad, the now retired admiral testify to that in court? Oh, I don't know if he'd want to admit this. I mean, the emperor rarely likes to admit they have no clothes. And I think this is another one of the problems. The secrecy takes on its own momentum when you have people who re- really are appalled at this. I mean, Lord Hill Norton, who was a five-star admiral in Great Britain who I met with, uh, told me personally when I was at his home that he, as the head of the MOD and also MI5 and MI6, had never been told about this information. It was only after he was in the House of Lords he later found out that there were highly secretive projects that were off his radar. And when I met with him, he was hopping mad. And I told him, sir, I said, you're in very good company. I've met with the CIA director, and he's in the same boat. He says, well, why wouldn't they have told me? And I said, uh, Admiral, if you had been told, what would you have done? He says, well, I wouldn't have stood for this sign of chicanery. I said, that's why they didn't tell you. So the litmus test is whether you're really r- ready to go along with, with the secrecy and the agenda of the secrecy, which is really the power of center isn't in government per se. It's really in corporate and contracting world. You know, my uncle was with Northrop Grumman. He, my uncle was the senior project engineer that designed the lunar module that put the first man on the moon just part of how I found out about some of these things. But when you look at Lockheed Martin and uh, Northrop Grumman and some of these very large corporations, this is where the center of power is. And this is certainly where all the contracting and the uh, work that's being done on the study of the energy and propulsion systems behind these uh, craft are, are occurring. If you've just tuned in, my guest is Dr. Stephen Greer. Stephen Greer is both the director and the founder of what's known as the Disclosure Project, which is essentially the Centre for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence. My name's Steve Austin, and this is ABC Local Radio, Queensland and 612 ABC Brisbane. Stephen Greer, um, okay, so your retired Admiral, Admiral couldn't find out about it. The President of the United States doesn't have information about it, and the CIA Director James Wolseley personally told you that he felt he was being lied to about it um then then who is who can you point me in some direction who is the the people running this are you saying it's corporate heavyweights with for financial vested interests are running well, there, there are a number of corporations over the years that have had had uh projects related to this that we have documents to, and, and, and people who work in them, such as uh, SAIC, Science Applications International Corporation. I mentioned Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman. Uh, there are others, MITRE Corporation, Atlantic Research Corporation, uh, Raytheon and E-Systems. And I've met with executives from many of these who, who have told me about the projects they have. Um, and it isn't as if no one in government knows about this. The problem is is that there's sort of a, a permanent bureaucracy that has chosen to keep this secret. And, and you don't have to take my word for it. I mean, in October, the Federation of American Scientists, a very mainstream organization, came out with a report in, on October 21st of last year that there are 5,135 inventions that are under secrecy orders. And they, they can't get a list of them, but the last list they could get was from 1971. Now, that's, of course, 40 years ago. And in that list were solar photovoltaic generators, and I'm quoting here, that were subject to restriction if they were 20% efficient or more, and that any energy conversion system uh, was likewise uh, subject to review and restriction if they offered conversion efficiencies in excess of 70 to 80 percent. So in other words, super efficient energy systems were classified by abusing the National Security Act. And this is something that is a provable fact. Now you have to ask then, is the tail wagging the dog? Has have interests that are, I hate to say this, transnational energy and oil and other financial interests trumped the national security interest, the genuine national security interest of the people. And in fact, this uh, American uh, Federation of Scientists uh, report says one may fairly ask if disclosure of such technologies could really have been detrimental to the national security or whether the opposite would be closer to the truth. And indeed, that's the case. You know, here we are talking about, you know, carbon taxes and 
all kinds of schemes that are going to cost hundreds of billions of dollars when uh, on a black shelf sitting at Lockheed Martin are so-called zero-point uh, and anti-gravity energy generation systems that are not being released to the public. And this is outrageous, in my opinion. My guest is Dr. Stephen Greer. My name's Steve Austin, and this is ABC Local Radio across the state. Stephen Greer, so uh, the uh, joining the dots of, of the Disclosure Project's uh, platform, or if you like, or idea, is, is that that there are UFOs and that, and that also... Um, a big moneyed interest, industrial interests have developed um, anti-propulsion or, sorry, a propulsion, new sort of forms of propulsion. And, and what is the, your contention that we, that, that vested interests learn this from, from uh, the people that run the UFOs or that we develop? In other words, the UFOs are actually from Earth. Actually, it's both. If you go back, we have documents dating from 1920s where T. Townsend Brown and others had done work with very high-voltage systems resulting in a mass cancellation effect, in other words, where things would lift and float. Um, this is also, uh, we found out, went black in 1954, and we have people who I'm working with in the, in the Department of Defense and the CIA who can document literally to the month and the year when all of this information went very, very black and off the radar scope. So it was a combination of, of inventions and breakthroughs that humans had, and then in the post-World War II era, era, when we began to have a lot of our nuclear facilities overflown by UFOs that were, I think, clearly not of, of Earth origin, um, and a few of them were able to be downed using electromagnetic weapon systems. We studied those technologies, and I think both those things together led to some massive technological breakthroughs in the mid-1950s. In fact, uh, I understand that by the late 50s and early 60s, we had prototypes of these sort of new energy and propulsion systems that were flying, but obviously their disclosure would, would have meant the end of, of, of oil and gas and coal. And I might add public utilities, because what these technologies do is that they extract energy from the so-called a zero-point energy field or quantum vacuum energy field that's in the space around us, not outer space, but the space, the room you're sitting in. And it's estimated that every cubic centimeter of space uh, has enough energy to run the Earth for a day if you could tap into it. What these very high-voltage systems do is that they open a tap into that latent energy system. And so they basically you would not need to have transmission lines uh, or a surface roads between cities, or uh, fossil fuels, or nuclear power. Now, you know, with Gray, what's going on interrupt. in Japan, let you have to wonder why in the world wouldn't we bring these out? But you, you have to understand this would be one of the largest uh, technological and financial revolutions in human history. Given what you've just told me, though, you can ex in other words, you can explain basically how it works. Why don't you just get together with someone from MIT and make it? That's what we're proposing to do. You've asked an excellent question. Um, we recently formed. Uh, the Orion Project org. It's a not for profit, uh, and we're we've actually put together a, uh, an eighteen month to two year proposal. We're looking for about five point seven million dollars in initial grant funding to pull some of these scientists together who, in fact, have worked in classified projects on this. We have about a Massachusetts dozen Institute scientists. of Technology is working on really cutting edge solar power projects. You know, I mean, really yeah, quite, but but really quite <laughs> efficient. They must be very close themselves. Surely they would be interested if you were able to lay out to them in schematic form or in terms of scientific formula and, lay, and say, here's our evidence. They would surely have a look at that and say, yep, we think we can make this work or otherwise. Well, I think maybe the academics in Australia are a lot more open-minded than the United States. Um, I, I will say that a lot of these large institutions, like in MIT, do have classified projects. And I will also say that yes. many of these patents that I just shared, 5,135 of them, have come out of universities where they have stumbled across. I mean, look, the laws of the universe are universal. And, and they have stumbled. But what happens is that someone comes in and then says, look, this is going to be classified, and you cannot talk about it. I, am, in fact, have worked recently with a man who, who now works for the U.S. government who had his own company in the 1970s who had built one of these systems. And folks came in. They said, look, this now belongs to us. This is classified. It's going into the vault. If you speak of it, you're going to jail. And this is not a conspiracy theory. This actually happens every day. Yes. And yes, uh, the understand. mainstream scientific community knows this, and so do the university researchers know this. They know very good and well that this happens. So we as a people have to come together and decide, look, it's time for this 
era to change into an era where we're, we have a totally new paradigm for energy generation and how we live on this planet. But it's a very large change to undertake. All right. So uh, a combination of uh, uh, some form of alien life from other planets combined with uh, vested uh, economic industrial interests here on Earth uh, are deliberately covering up the potential use of alternative energy because there's a buck in in fossil fuels. Well, I doubt very seriously any extraterrestrial civilizations would be interested. Sure. Okay, in, but, yeah, but, but at least the, earth, the earthly component <laughs> of this. This is, this is your contention that the earthly component of it is covering the it earthly up component. And I don't think it's I don't think it's hard to figure out when you as someone once did an analysis of this in terms of the futures trading and commodities trading and all of this. It's something like several hundred trillion dollars in assets that are at stake here. Right. Uh, and, and I can assure you, for that, those kind of special interests have a great deal of clout. Um, I think the the problem is it's an education problem that people need to know about this our leaders need to know about it and we need to demand change and, and rather than putting as the Obama administration is now suggesting some 36 billion dollars in loan guarantees for more nuclear power plants we need to take half of one percent of that and do an R&D project in this area so we don't have to have more nuclear power plants or coal or oil fired power plants and, right. and this would fix a great many of our problems a couple of years ago Stephen Greer uh, January 2009 you wrote a, a pretty good concise uh, brief to the president of the United States uh, Barack Obama I think a six-page brief what was his response well you know this was provided to people on my team who are very close to the president and uh, this is still being looked at, and there are people in other countries looking at this. Uh, I can tell you that they're very sympathetic to ending secrecy. I can also tell you that it's, it's a, it would be a mistake to assume that this president uh, has operational control over those sort of classified projects. So he's got a lot on his plate. Um, the other problem is that this subject is, uh, you know, I had a, an Air Force major once tell me, he says, look, just through the force of ridicule of this, you know, little green men, blah, 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 ha, 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 most politicians do not want to touch something that would not redound sure. to their esteem. And so sure. I think that that's one of the problems. And I, But I will tell you that there's a great deal of sympathetic response to the idea of ending secrecy on these matters. But being interested in the subject and having the moral courage to make that change are two separate things. We'll see what happens over the next coming months and years of his administration. Sure. My view of it, and this is my view of it, having now been doing this for 20 years and, and briefing many people in, in these sort of places in government around the world, not just the United States, is that it really is going to come from us. It's going to come from the people. It's going to come not from the power centers of large universities and corporations and governments. And, and I honestly believe that we need to do it. And I think, in fact, we can. In fact, the Disclosure Project launched the worldwide disclosure movement where now we have the, the British government releasing documents and information, Denmark is, Chile is, governments all over the world. So we can do the same thing with these energy systems, but I'm, I'm skeptical, uh, I, I'm hopeful but skeptical that this will come out of government or large corporate interests per se. I think it's more likely to come out of uh, uh, people who organize around this who have the courage to go the distance. Okay, look, I, I, I take your point, and I've, I've been very careful not to in any way ridicule. I try and, you know, take it on face value and ask probing questions that, you know... No, no, you're, you're that, great, that, yeah. that, ..to try and, you know, so just try and test the theory. Now, so, so okay, so the president got this letter, but if, if, if President uh, Clinton couldn't get to the bottom of it and others before him, the head of the CIA couldn't get to the bottom of it, um, who, who do you believe is the likely candidate for, um, you know, there must be some sort of council, some sort of group that says, look, let's do this thing for our personal interest or our, for whatever reasons. There's someone making decisions. Well, now, yes, there are, and, and it's an international committee. Um, like it who? Used to be called, it used to be called Majestic, um, and we have documents related to this a group. And um, who makes Magi. up Majestic? Um, over, historically, there have been some people from the intelligence community and corporate world. For example, Admiral Bobby Ray Inman was a member for many years. Uh, George Schultz has been. Uh, there was a Democratic uh, congressman from California. The former Secretary of State of the United States, George Schultz, under George Bush Sr. Yes. And uh, there, there are other folks. I mean, Dick Cheney has been involved in these sort of operations historically. And you know, it, one, it, one of the interesting things on the campaign trail, someone asked uh, W. Bush um, when he was running you know, about the UFO issue. He says, well, I don't really know anything about it, but Dick would, referring to Dick Cheney. <laughs> so, you know, the, the thing is, is that the people who have an interest, I hate to say this, in, in large macroeconomic 
systems and, and oil and what have you, uh, tend to uh, protect their interests. And, and this is one of the problems. And I think that it isn't necessarily in the national security interests of the United States, as the Federation of American Scientists have pointed out in the report uh, on these issues. And I think that one of the things, uh, when, when you look at the folks who, who have been involved, they're not all for the same reason. I think some people genuinely felt that the public couldn't handle this information in the 40s and 50s, and then secrecy takes on its own momentum. There are other people who had economic interests, and there are other people who I think um, really just were afraid of the ramifications. You know, I, uh, Lawrence Rockefeller, who was uh, one of the, the, you know, I mean, he was David Rockefeller's brother and hosted me at the, his ranch and later the Clintons at his ranch to be briefed on this subject. And, and he told me one night, he says, you know, the implications of this, Dr. Greer, are such that no aspect of life on earth will be untouched by it. I said, yes, Mr. Rockefeller, that's why it's been kept secret. It's not because it's trivial. It's because the implications are so vast and profound. And so I think that, um, you know, there are interests uh, that, that are from a number of sectors who have been involved in these decisions, as well as people in uh, the military and in government. I'm not saying no one in military and government have been, but it's not based on your rank. It's based on whether you've been in those projects and you're willing to go along with the agenda of secrecy, which is what the Lord Hill Norton discovered uh, after he left the, the, being the director of the Ministry of Defense in Great Britain. My guest is Dr. Stephen Greer, director and founder of The Disclosure Project. This is ABC Local Radio, Queensland and 612 ABC Brisbane Coast FM on the Golden Sunshine Coast and more. Let me come at the whole issue from a completely different direction, Stephen, if I can. Sure. Um, uh, There's an Australian scientist who now uh, lives in the UK, Paul Davies, quite well known. I'm sure you know his name. He's a a well-known astrophysicist. um, And he's just recently written a book called The Appalling Silence. Paul Davies is the global head of the SETI project, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, and his open, publicly stated position as a scientist and someone who would like to find extraterrestrial intelligence is, however, sadly, that there is none, that the universe is unfortunately appallingly silent. Uh, um, and I, at, at this stage, we appear to be alone. I think he knows better. And um, I don't want to speak out of school, but I will say that a very senior person involved with the founding of the SETI project told me personally that, in fact, they do know that we're not alone, and that that has been kept secret. I, I question very seriously the veracity of that statement, uh, any more than, you know, when Stephen Hawking said, you know, if we do encounter these, that they're going to somehow uh, eat us for lunch, uh, in so many words. And, and I think that there are a lot of uh, people who, uh, for example, a, a man who uh, works with my team who had worked very closely with Carl Sagan and many of the other uh, pioneers in the SETI effort, told me that he was at a facility when, in fact, a signal did come in and that this was a very much kept secret and that I don't know that, uh, and, I, and I've debated this with Seth Shostak and other people at SETI, uh, that, there's, uh, that they're being forthright in what they're saying on this. And, yeah, but, and but signals come in all the time. The point is what is, what is background noise and what is an actual intelligence uh, communicated message from an alternative life form is, the, is what they're looking for. Yes, and I think they know, in fact, uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Richard Haynes, who, who worked for many years at NASA Ames um, uh, and, and who had worked with my, my group for many years, uh, uh, was, when, when, when SETI was housed at NASA Ames, said to, to one of the leaders there, he said, what would I tell you if, I, if, 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 if my assessment was that the SETI project is really trying to create a smoke screen, but you already know that we're being visited, and that by pretending to listen for a signal, it gives the message to the scientific community and to the public that there's nothing out there when, in fact, you know they're landing on terra firma. And this official with SETI turned to Dr. Haynes and said, well, Dick, I'd say that you're a very smart man. Stephen Greer, so so, essentially what you're saying you know, is that Paul Davies you know, is, is, is part of a very substantial scientific cover-up. Oh, I don't know that. Now, he may or may not know about this. I, Paul Davies, I don't know. I know that we have... Uh, had discussions about this. He's seen this other evidence. Uh, he holds the opinion he holds. I can't say for sure that he, in fact, is part of any cover-up. He may simply have not been privy to certain uh, data. But it's very hard for me to imagine. Now, one of the problems is that, you know, I don't. I tell people, please don't take my word for it. You can go to disclosureproject.org. We have put together hundreds uh, of people's testimony who are 
of high-ranking people. We have literally hundreds of pages of, of documents about th this issue, about landing cases. There are 3,500 cases where these objects have landed on the ground and left physical evidence. And the Ministry of Defense of, of Great Britain is beginning to release some of these. Um, the one at Randlesham Forest at the uh, Bentwaters uh, Royal Air Force Base is one of the more famous cases that Lord Hill Norton looked into, where there was physical evidence. And uh, we have witnesses who were there who saw the craft land and leave this physical evidence. So, you know, it's forget about a signal from outer space. There's evidence that's on terra firma. The other thing is that there are over 4,000 pilot cases where, and we have the actual radar tape, we have the pilot testimony, we have the air traffic controller testimony, where these objects have been seen, photographed, radar traced, and very skilled observers who are pilots have seen them. So you cannot brush all that away. And in fact, I think people who do, it, it's strange credulity. I mean, this is why we launched disclosureproject.org, and that is to put this evidence together in one place where, in fact, the public can look at it, study it, and decide for themselves. How long have you been involved in this area of research, Stephen Greer? Since 1990. Uh, actually, uh, the, uh, the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence was founded in 1990. And uh, I have had a lifelong interest uh, in this since my uncle uh, was working on the lunar module and, and designing the, the device that put Neil Armstrong on the moon. And I think that, uh, you know, this is something that, that I've been interested in. I'm an emergency physician by training, but, you know, in the uh, 1990s, I took a very active interest in this and got pulled into it quite inadvertently simply because uh, some people I knew <laughs> who were friends with Bill Clinton and the CIA director uh, R. James Woolsey and others, and, and also various members of, of the Senate, Senator Claiborne Pell uh, and others on the Foreign Relations Committee and Senate Intelligence Committee, said, look, these people are curious about this. Will you brief them? And so I got pulled into this more and more and more until a couple of years ago. I, I left my medical uh, work to do this uh, all the time because I think that the implications are so important. And it isn't just about whether we're alone in the universe, which is an interesting philosophical uh, question. But it's also about how we as human beings are going to be able to live on this planet for another 50, 100, 1,000 years. And we certainly cannot do that with 7 billion people using fossil fuels. And I dare say a nuclear power, which as we're seeing in Japan, is, is a catastrophe waiting to happen. Um, so from your point of view, bottom line is we are not alone. In the, while there might not be a god, there certainly is aliens. Um, and uh, and what? Oh, I believe there's a God. It does, I mean, I think a universal conscious being does not preclude life on other planets. In fact, the Vatican has said as much recently, as you know. And uh, in fact, when I met with Monsignor Balducci at the Vatican, he, he said very specifically that there is no conflict between the idea of a, uh, a supreme being and the fact that there could be life elsewhere. In fact, how tragic it would be if, if there was such a supreme being that he would have put all his hopes in, in the, 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 the situation with humanity. Stephen Greer, I really appreciate your time.